Hello there. Uh, my name is Frank Ferretti. I'm a sociologist. And since, what, 1995, the question I've been working on and being preoccupied with is that of fear. I think we live in a culture that is disposed towards scaring us all of the time. We live in a culture where fear is always in the air, where there are subliminal hints and messages that continually tell us, beware, be scared, life is complicated out there. And in fact, one of the uh, sayings that you hear time and time again in all kinds of circumstances is when somebody looks you in the eye and tells you, Frank, don't be a hero. The number of times I to I've been told not to be a hero is, is fascinating. I, I was recently in America, and we ran out of milk. So I decided that, you know, why not go downstairs, go to a shop, get a pint of milk so we can drink our coffee. And the lady whose house I was staying in said, Frank, it's late at night, don't be a hero. <laughs> you know, sort of. And you know, when even the most elementary aspects of life come with a health warning, you know that something is really wrong. It's very difficult to be brave, to be courageous, to take chances, whenever you are told by some wise old person, don't be a hero. Now, I became interested in this issue of fear in 1995, when my son was, uh, was born. And I was very anxious, as most new fathers are, about all kinds of things. You know, was the child going to cry a lot? Was my life going to be turned upside down? Was the baby going to be healthy? Was my wife going to be all right after this event? So I'm rushing down the hospital. I have all these very personal things going on in my head. And as I arrive there, the lady who's in charge of the, the ward looks at me and takes me aside and says, Mr. Ferredi, I have very good news for you. And I thought she was going to say, it's a beautiful baby. The baby looks just like you. Yeah, the baby's going to be Einstein. You know, all these things you say, yeah, very good news for you. And she says, the good news is you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry because we put an armband around your baby, which means that the little, little baby could, will never get lost in the ward and will never be kidnapped. And when she said, will never be kidnapped, I was kind of taken aback a lot because we live in a very peaceful part of Kent in southern England where everything is relatively gentle. And the last thing that I would ever fantasize about is my newly born baby going to be kidnapped? It never entered my mind, and maybe I'm irresponsible. You know, I should have gone online and checked out all the possibilities, but they were absolutely certain uh, that this was an issue that I had to confront. I should tell you that un until that point, the only thing that I worried about, the classical father problem, is how to put the baby seat in the car. I'm not very good with my hands, and I literally spent about four hours fiddling around trying to put the baby seat in the car. But that wasn't the issue. It was the issue of kidnap. And at that point in my life, I really started as a sociologist, not as a father, thinking about why is it that even the most lovely, humane, wonderful, mystical experiences, such as the arrival of a new, newborn child, has got to be enveloped in this talk about crises, these problems about fear. What's really going on in our world that makes that happen? And I kind of looked around and began to write about, I wrote a book called The Culture of Fear, where I began to understand that we live in a world where fear has almost developed a, a free-floating character. It's almost like it's in the air all the time, and fear kind of attaches itself to all kinds of improbable issues. So on Monday, you know, we're all worried about an epidemic breaking out in the middle of Africa. By Tuesday, we become distracted by the fact that global warm, um, warming is melting the ice in, in Alaska. By the time you get to Wednesday, you hear about homegrown terrorism. By Thursday, it's immigration. By Friday, it's crime. And just when you think you've seen it all, you know, somebody comes along and, and tells you about the fact that there's a new epidemic of, of chicken flu that has broken out. And that's just in one week that that occurs. And it's almost like you've got this spectacle of fear in front of your eyes, which continually haunts our imagination and very much shapes the way, we, the, the way that we think. 
I think in many ways, the problem is particularly relevant for us as human beings in relation to young people and children. You know, when I heard the nurse tell me that my baby is not going to be kidnapped, that was in the end. Because the week after and the month after, I was told by health visitors about all kinds of health risks that I had to be aware of. I was told about the fact that children you know, need to be protected and insulated from all kinds of difficult and unpredictable, uncertain diseases and, and, and people. In fact, a month after uh, uh, this happened, I went to Washington. And in Washington, I went to visit uh, a toy shop in order to buy a gift for my friend's son. As, I, as the lady was wrapping up the present, she looked at me and said, Sir, can I interest you in one of our new products? And I said, sure, what, what is this new product that uh, you want me to be interested in? And she says, well, we got this new product called an indoor helmet that children can wear inside a house. An indoor helmet. You can imagine little three-year-old children with this helmet you know, toddling around the room, you know, making their way. And at first, I, I thought she was just joking. You know, she's kind of making fun of me. She thought, you know, there's an idiot here who doesn't know about toys. But then I realized there's a whole stack of what they call kid safety helmets, you know, sort of over there on the left. And in a sense, when you get to a, a situation where children are even immunized from the experience of what happens within the house, you know that you've got a lot of problems. And it just goes on, because when the children take off their indoor helmet and go outside, they literally put on their outdoor helmet. Because now, many children in many parts of the world are no longer allowed to walk to school on their own or with their friends. Their parents drive them. And sometimes when you look at a school in England, there seem to be more adults in front of the school gate than children. It's almost like they're all kind of hovering over them. Children are not allowed to go out and play. You know, the whole freedom and the adventure that comes with outdoor play, where kids, in a sense, begin to learn their strengths and their weaknesses and interact with each other, that's now all done under adult supervision. Children are, are taught not to talk to strangers. And by strangers, not to talk to any adult other than their family members or their, or their neighbors. And just think of the effect of this. Children are growing up being scared of adults. I mean, what kind of message are we sending to young people when they imagine that everybody, anybody over the age of 17 or 18 is a potential threat to their life? I mean, what is really going on when, when this begins to occur? And as you see kids developing and, and getting older, the, f the message of fear doesn't really end. The capacity for our society to prevent young people from going out and discovering themselves, of experimenting, of having an adventure, is truly incredible. We now have this new ritual in many parts of the Western world where when young people finish high school, they go on a gap year. A gap year is when you take a year off before, uh, before going to work. And in your gap year, you're meant to go out and discover yourself. You're meant to have an adventure. You're meant to become enriched by, by the experience of going to strange places and gain greater self-knowledge. Unfortunately, the gap year experience has become an industry. So we now have all kinds of schemes that are organized by businesses where a package is developed, so basically you're, the, chil the child is told, if you go to Chile, we'll provide you with an experience. You, know, you, you spend six months here, three months there. We're going to have responsible adults making sure you don't get into, uh, into any kind of trouble. And you even have what's called gap year fairs, where you go with your parents, and there are all these exhibitors there saying, please come here. You know, we just got this wonderful package of, of gap year experience in Africa, where for six months you build a well, and then for three months, you can go to a beach. I'm going to have very responsible adults there. It's all organized. You know, it's a message to the parent. Don't be, don't be worried. And if you cannot make up your mind about what gap year experience you're going to have, we now have gap year experts. That's their job. I mean, imagine being a gap year expert, telling a 19-year-old, I'm going to tell you how to have an adventure. And this is what you must do. So the whole idea of, 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 of kids striking on their, on their own, is being continually inhibited by this don't be a hero culture. And that don't be a hero culture, I think, is very much 
uh, integrated and is very much related to the new ways in which we begin to think of risk, the way we regard taking chances or taking opportunities. You know, when I was a young person, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, and I hesitated about doing something, we all do, we often hesitate. My trick was to cover up from my hesitation by pretending that I had to rearrange my record collection. So whenever I had to do something that was very difficult or challenging, I developed this tactic of rearranging my record collection in alphabetical order. A lot of times I did that. But whenever I did that, my father would say, hey, Frank, it's just, this is a good risk. Why don't you seize the opportunity and make things happen? And he actually used the word, which we no longer use today in the English language, a good risk. A good risk. And the reason why that's significant is because today, whenever we think about risk, it's almost always associated with a danger. There is no such thing as a good risk anymore. It's no longer uh, uh, something that to do, is to do with uncertainty and chance. Risk has become a synonym for danger. It's, it's perilous. And whereas in previous times, people would take risks and smile and celebrate risk-taking as an adventure, people would travel all around the world on their own to try to discover new scientific products on their own. They would take risks and see that as being part and parcel of their way of gain, gaining maturity. Today, risk-taking is almost always associated with an act of irresponsibility. So when somebody is told that they're risk takers, sooner or later somebody will come along and say they are irresponsible. It's not responsible to take risks. And that, in a sense, is one of the most powerful messages that you and I are told in a variety of ways by the kind of cultures that we inhabit. You know, don't be brave, don't take risks, be responsible. And responsible doesn't mean what it used to mean, calculating events using our reason. Responsibility means taking yourself out of harm's way, not taking any chances, not really daring to do very much. However, I think you all know this, I don't have to tell you this, risk is an inescapable fact of life. You know, whether you like it or not, we always are confronted with risk. Every important decision that we make, even about the most intimate or aspects of our life, involves a risk. I mean, take the act of falling in love. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. When you fall in love, you know, you are taking a risk. Just imagine the process. Gradually, you get drawn to this other person. There's a, an inner force that drives you towards this very important person in your life. And as you're getting closer and closer, you behave in ways that before you thought was unimaginable, totally unimaginable. You're telling that person everything about yourself. You're disclosing all kinds of information, all kinds of emotions that you would never, ever share with anybody else. That's the beauty of falling in love. I mean, you really are opening up, and the other person is also opening up to you. And, 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 and the buzz, what's really nice about falling in love, is all of a sudden, you can almost feel it, it's almost palpable, you're coming closer and closer and closer together. So it's, in many respects, a, a unique experience. But of course, it's also very risky. In fact, I would argue there's nothing more risky than falling in love, because you invest so much of yourself, you invest so much of your emotion in falling in love, that if, for some reason, things go wrong, and in my experience, they often go wrong, on more than one occasion, then you basically feel pain. You know, the pain of rejection, never mind the pain of betrayal, is a really, really traumatic experience. You really burn your fingers as a result of that. So you could argue, you know, why do it? You know, why, why you know, worry, worry about what's going to happen? You can avoid the pain. And of course, yes, you could avoid the pain by not trying to fall in love. But if you avoid the pain, if you avoid the possibility that things might go wrong, you will never experience what is a very fundamental and important part of our lives as human beings. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this about love, and it's something that I, we all need to think about very, very seriously, because love is really about trusting each other, coming closer, is because we now have a veritable industry that makes a lot of money out of telling us that love is something we could do without, that we should stay away from it. 
So whenever I go into a bookshop in a big city, and I go to the self-help section, I always go to the self-help section of the bookshop, you will almost immediately see a bestseller, at, uh, a bestseller book in the, in, in the bookshop titled, For Women Who Love Too Much. <laughs> right? For Women Who Love Too Much. I would have thought a better book would have, would have been For Women Who Don't Love or, you know, or Finding It Difficult to Love. But anyways, For Women Who Love Too Much. That's the problem that this book is, is dealing with. And as you turn left, especially if you're not a woman, you know, I'm mean, not interested in you know, women who love too much, I'm interested in something else, there will be a book there for people who love their pets too much. <laughs> right. Apparently it's a huge problem that we like our pussycats a lot, and we spend too much time stroking them. You know, so the book tells us how to keep a bit of psychic distance. <laughs> Anyways, it seems to me that when we have you know, that kind of dynamic, then there are problems, and I suppose the, the book that I find most objectionable uh, and it's, it's a book that you can find on Amazon. It's a book that's titled For Parents Who Love Too Much. <laughs> now, as a father, I say to myself, how could you love your child too much? I mean, what is the world coming to? Do I just kind of hold back and say, you know, not today, Jimmy. Uh, my, love, <laughs> my love is going to be sp spread somewhere else. You know, what's going on? And, but as a sociologist, I'm also sad that love has become this physical unit that we calculate, we risk manage, we reduce to units that could be doled out. So that you know, love no longer becomes a, a powerful emotion that's integral to us, it becomes something very, very different. And I think that uh, this has got some very imp important implications for us, because if love, if even love, which is a very elementary dimension of our experience, become subjugated to this culture of fear, then we do lose a love of our humanity. And my project in life, in, in my work, is very simple. What I try to tell people, and certainly try to tell myself as well, because we're all implicated in this, we're all dominated by this, I self tell people a very simple message, which is that if you must worry, if you must be really scared, you know, sort of don't worry about loving too much. If you must worry, worry about loving too little. And it seems to me that once we begin to think like that and trust ourselves as human beings, that it allows us to escape from the dominant influence that this culture of, fe of fear has upon us, and we can begin to act in our own way, in a courageous, bold, and even on a good day, a heroic manner.